looking down. You know, it's amazing how that uh, your your birth, where you're born, determines your ideologies uh, for the most part. It's, it's kind of amazing that we could we here. If we was born in all of us, if we was born in Mexico, we built the Catholic Church this morning, get forgiveness for what we did yesterday. And uh, if we was born in India, we'd all be Hindus. And if we was born in Iraq, we'd all be Muslims. If we was born in China, we'd all be Buddhist. So here we are, born in America, and we're just a crock pot. <laughs> <laughs> We're smorgasbord. We are not sure what we are. <laughs> what, what, what we? Uh, but that's amazing. Your your birth determines that, uh, for the most part. For the most part. And so most people follow their whatever birth beliefs they were born into. They pretty pretty much follow that somewhat. You know. Yeah. And then there are people like us who begin to get a little bit out of the box and think a little bit out of the box, and so. So anyway, I want to read you some notes that I wrote, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm aware that the things that I would say will be controversial. I am aware of that, and uh, I don't mean to be controversial, and I just, uh, my studies seem to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. I'm not purposely trying to do that. Actually, I tried to read some material that, that resonated with some friends, and I tried to read it, tried to read it, and I had actually read it years and years ago, and it just wouldn't resonate. I just, it just didn't. You, have you ever had that? I've had mm -hmm. books that I buy, and I'm going to read that book, and I, yeah. you know, I'm really excited about that book, and I read maybe five, ten pages, and it just, I'm just not getting it for some reason. I, so I always put it on the on the shelf or side beside. I may go back to it in five years and pick it up, and man, it's just, it just, Resonate. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that happen to y'all too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good deal. Okay, well that means we're all normal. <laughs> uh, oh, but uh, what I'm going to say uh, has to do with uh, with the miracle, and, and that's actually I, I don't always title my messages, but the miracle of the human body, mm -hmm. or I would just say the miracle of you or me, mm -hmm. the, the miracle of the self, S-E-L-F. And to elaborate on it, and uh, you know, and I say this often. For me, the Scripture, the Bible, has become a analogical book about the physical body. Uh, for me, that's what it has become more and more and more. I, I see that in it through my vein of study, and I, re I realize it because people call me who get the monthly CDs and they ask me questions: How did I get that? And this, that, and the other. And so I can explain that to them, and, well, where can I read a book? I, I'm not really sure where you can read a book about that. And so uh, my, uh, I think my quest has been in the, in the book of Genesis more than anything else in the last 20 or 30 years. Probably in the book of Genesis has been the, the quest of the core of my studies. And that, the reason for that being is what Jesus said in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, and 7, when he said, unless you build your house on the foundation, the solid rock. Mm -hmm. And I use this analogy. My grandfather said, if you want to know what somebody said, go to them. And I, I had this quest for years to know what the scripture really said. And I, I kept going back to the original source and the original source, the original. So I, that was this back and back. And more, the more I go back to the original source, I'd say, wow, it don't say in the source we've got, i.e. the Bible, what it says in the original source. And I said, how could we be off track that far? And so most of our thinking, whether we are Catholic or Protestant of any shape, form, or fashion, most of our thinking comes out of the first 10 or 12 chapters of Genesis. And we don't even know that. We're not even aware of that. We have ideologies that something or another, our first parents made a mistake i.e. Adam and Eve, they sinned, and in their sin, they brought the entire human race down, and therefore God was very angry with them and sought to kill them and finally decided, I'll just take this one guy in his family and just start everything over again. 
And we have that really deeply rooted in us. We don't know that. We, we're not really that much aware of it. And then people write books and materials off the basis of that idea. And then we glean from the books and material thinking that material is rich in truth. It's really not. It might be true by what it's saying, but it's not really the truth. And that's, I, I, you know, I know that's not easy to, to comprehend, especially when we have strong beliefs about the things that we feel are true, don't we? I do. I mean, the things that I feel are true. You know, if, if I felt it's really true that Adam and Eve did sin and bring the whole human race down, I would def try to defend that. I would try to fight in a defense for that to prove it to be. And that's, that's what my quest has caused me to find out why it's not true. Because my study shows me that it's not. Anyway, so I want to read you something. The most valuable gift and the most, the most precious commodity that exists is the self. The self. That's, and and I, I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll say this in many different ways. The S-E-L-F. Now would you say, well, why in the world would you think that? Because under the self, we have this, this word, E-G-O. What is the ego? The ego is the self. And so if I'm saying the most precious commodity that we have, and as a matter of fact, I will go even out further on the limb and say, actually, the self, the ego is one of God's greatest gifts that he gave us. Hallelujah. How could that possibly be? When all material, I, I mean, I read some, I, I read from some, a lot of different people, thinkers, different, uh, Carl Jung, you know, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, people who, neurologists, people who, uh, who think different. And they all, tell me that the self and the ego is my greatest enemy. My worst problem is that. And then how in the world here I am, this little country boy said, no, it's the greatest gift God gave you. And as we are able to see that, and, and I, I guess that's, that's the conundrum right there. If, if you don't see it, you just don't see it. That doesn't make anybody right or wrong. And if, but if I say that because I see that, that may make me wrong in your eyes if you don't see it. And I, and, and that's, that's, I think that's fair. So I'm not upset by that. So our most valuable gift and most precious commodity exists is the self, the soul. Because if I say the self, the ego, and the soul... Uh, you probably wouldn't think of them as the same. Most likely you wouldn't. You might. Genesis 2-7, I can show you that the soul is the gift of God to life you. I, I'll, I'll show you that. It is. Mm -hmm. But then when I use the ego and the self, am I using them in a term that will, coincide, that will agree with the soul? And the answer is yes, absolutely. For instance, the word ego, uh, gosh, I've done a bunch of research on that particular word. The ego actually is a word that goes back in Greek. Actually, it is the Greek word for I, self, or myself. And that is, the, that is the Greek word ego. That's what the word means in the Greek, ego. So that goes back 2,500 years. In Latin, it's exactly the same word, ego. That's the Latin word ego for the word I, self, or myself. Okay? And so then when I come into the Hebrew, what do I 
find in Hebrew for the word I, myself, or my ego. In Hebrew, it's this word right here. I wanted to spell it. It's the Aleph with the non and the yod. And in Hebrew, actually, the word is Ani. 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 That's the Hebrew word for I, myself, the ego. And, and, and I, can use, I can show you a lot of different places where that word is used. Now, I'm going to, uh, uh, that's Ani. Can everybody just say that? Um, 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 okay. Now let me everybody say this word. Aniaki. Ani Ani Have you ever heard of Anunnaki? Yeah. Well, what did you think of Anunnaki? I, I know you have. I know you think of Anunnaki. I know you've heard a lot of material of the Anunnaki. Who do you think the Anunnaki is? Is it a tyrant? Is it a ancient? It's an ancient Indian or an ancient being, the Anunnaki. Do you know they come from the word Enoch? You ever heard of Enoch? Oh, yeah. Genesis chapter four and five. Enoch, yeah. yeah. See all of see all of these stories that are woven right in there. Genesis one, two, three, four, and five, and six, seven. All of these stories right there. There are just so many stories that have evolved from that. That's an era that aren't true. Because all of those stories and all of that is about this right here. It's about I, myself, my ego, my soul. It's, it's all about that. Why? Because if we're going to be in this dimension, why would a creator create its creation and then dislike its creation? That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Huh? To me, that would be ridiculous. A creator. In other words, if I'm going to call God a creator, is that fair? Can you call God a creator? Can we call God uh, the Father, the Source, the Creator? What, what is God's creation? I, myself. You didn't create yourself, did you? The Creator created you. Why would the Creator create you? For itself. See? So here you hear a lot of self. So is the self wrong? And my, my, my idea is no, it's not. It may have wrong information, which, ha which gives it wrong action, mm -hmm. or at least actions that won't serve it for its greater good. And the only reason that the action don't serve it for its greater good is because of the lack of training, or I will use this, ignorance. My people perish for the lack of knowledge, right? That's ignorance. My people are in captivity for the lack of knowledge. That's ignorance, right? So what would be, what would be our answer? Knowledge. But knowledge is one of the things we show them. So uh, let me come back over and read my note. Where did it go? Here we go. The soul. The soul is designed by the Creator for this thing we call time. And yet many of us think time, and, and I, that we read material, I read, I read material that tells me that time is basically my enemy or it's an illusion and it don't exist. If time didn't exist, nor would you. Yourself would. You would say, oh, but what about my eternal me? Well, your eternal you is in your temporal you. And if you don't merge them together and realize that they are one and the self same, self same, if you don't do that, if you can't do that, you can't live to your potential. And I don't know about you, but I know for me, Living for, living for and to my greatest potential is what I want to be. That's what I want to do. I, want to, I don't want to just 
just live. I want to live to the potential that I have. So I know within me is a deposit of the source, the creator, and that deposit of the source or the creator is there for me to tap into it or to draw from it or to learn of it, etc. So the creator loves its creation, then why don't we? Mm -hmm. When I'm talking about the creation, I'm talking about the earth, I'm talking about humanity, I'm talking about everything that exists in this realm, both good and evil. Because it says very clearly, Isaiah, the creator created both of those. Right? I tell you what, let's go over to Isaiah. So that we, you know, sometimes I say seeing is believing. You can quote something, I can say something. Uh-uh, that ain't right. That's wrong. Isaiah 53 and 4. Isaiah, look at Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, and let's just look at verse 1. It says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. And if you go down through here, you will see a lot of eyes. <laughs> Matter of fact, let's just go down through here. Thus saith the Lord, whose right hand I, who, that I, you see that I right there? You see that I? That's this word right here. And who's it talk? Who's this we're talking? Who's this, this speaking? Isn't it the Lord? Is it God? So see, God is referring to Himself, its own ego. It's the same thing. So, now watch this. You see it. You'll see it over and over and over. I have holden to subdue nations before Him, and I see that that word I. That's His Hebrew word, ani, ani, which is the root for the word. Anunnaki, the I, the self, the ego. I, I will loosen the loins of the kings and I will open for him, da 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 da. Verse 2, verse 2, I will go before him. That's Ani. I will go before him and make his crooked places straight. I, that's Ani, will break in pieces the gates of brass and I will cut asunder the bars. Verse 3, and I, that's Ani, will give. You see that? And we can just go over and over and over with it. All, and all through Scripture, it's just, it's just constantly over and over and over. You would say, well, is that important? It is, it is vastly important. It's huge. It, we, but, you know, it's something that so we have to... So each one of those eyes, are they ego? I'm sorry? Each one of the eyes is ego? It's the word ego. But it's referring to God. You mean God has an ego? See, that's, that's, the, that's what I want you to hum. <laughs> you know, I'll see, because you think, when you say ego, you automatically presuppose it's something that's bad or something that's in your way or something that you really don't want people to know that you got an ego. Don't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you generally do. That's generally how, how we feel. Well, look at verse 7. I, ego, this is God. Look here. I form the light, right? And I create the darkness. I, that's the ego, make peace and create evil. Wow. See, God did all that. God did that. So is it right or wrong? It's neither or. It's like left and right. God created the right. God created the left. And sometimes you need to go right. And sometimes you need to go left. So that would mean sometimes you need to go this way you call good. Sometimes you need to go this way that you call evil. That's really difficult, isn't it? <laughs> I, 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 boy, I mean, you get stuck on that. I, I know, I do too. I do too. I, and so I have to really come back and ask myself a tremendous amount of questions. So... And I'll, I'll try to make sense out of this in time here. So God created the soul for it to be in the dimension of time so that God, who is timeless, could be in time itself and experience that that it created. That's the whole purpose of it. 
The whole purpose of it is not to destroy it. See, well, in, in certain extreme facets of Christianity, God's going to destroy it. With the idea that He destroyed it one time with the flood, water, and killed everything and everybody. But that's not true. That's how we have been told that story is interpreted. And so, therefore, a majority, a mass majority of people believe that. Why? Because they feel like something about them, ego, is wrong, it's bad, it needs to be destroyed. It don't need to be destroyed, it needs to be cultivated. And, and my, my, what is it, my, my quest is to try to get us to understand the ego, the self, the I, is a little child. It's just a little child, which is you. That's, that you don't want to destroy it. You want to love it. You want to nourish it. You want to cherish it. You want to grow it up. Because it's in growing it up is where it learns to use all of the, the fa facilities that God gave it. In other words, what God gave us in the ani, the self, the ego, the soul, what God gave us is an ability to see. Gave us an ability to smell. Gave us an ability to feel, to touch, to taste. In other words, God gave us essential apparatus. Well, let's see your soul, your ego, yourself is that essential apparatus. So if you want to do away with your soul, yourself, your ego, then you're going to do away with your essential apparatus. And I don't know anybody... I don't think anybody wants to do that. But do those, do those things need to be matured? Without a doubt. Because if, my, if I don't train my eye, you realize there's really nothing out here. Everything that is, is in here. You see, I'm looking at you, and you think you're sitting out there, but you're not. You're sitting right back here. That's where you're at right now. You're back here in my head, in the back of my brain. Because that's what my eyes are doing. These lenses are looking out here, but it's projecting it all in me. It, it's all happening. In, and the same thing's true with you. You're sitting out there thinking you're looking up here at me. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm inside your head. <laughs> I'm in your head right now. So, God created the soul... The self ego, he created this little child to be in you so he could be in you in time. So don't want to destroy time, he wants to be in time to experience time. So time exists, and the reason time exists is to make manifest what God gets to experience in this dimension. Whether it's good, bad, right, wrong, whatever it is. God gets to experience it. God's not judging it. God's not condemning it. God's just experiencing it. Okay? I, I know it's hard, but that's... Souls are empowered to create anything and everything. Not right or wrong. They will create bliss or they will create turmoil. They will create sickness or they will create health. This is the greatest paradox of all times, yet completely and totally overlooked. Why? Mainly because religion has got us off track. And when I talk about off track, I just mean little by little. And I used this illustration a week or two, three weeks ago, I don't even remember, about Jim Jones. And how Jim Jones started out as a very anointed preacher in Indianapolis, Indiana, built a huge church and bought a large tract of land in South America and moved people down there slowly and slowly and finally got over a thousand people to drink Kool-Aid and kill themselves. In other words, they drunk a lie, called the lie the truth. They called the lie the truth. Why? Because there, there were certain things true in the lie. But that wasn't the truth. But they all had to drink the Kool-Aid because they accepted that. He just got tired of fooling with them. <laughs> I guess he did. I don't know. But that, subtly you can get off track. I mean, it's true with any of us. Subtly you can get off track. Yeah, subtly. 
So, so we have all of these different ideas that we gain, uh, that we, we get from religion that that's, uh, starts out with its ideology to help us. That's, that's how it starts. It starts with the idea that it's going to help us. So to experience life is the main reason that we're here. Is that not true? Isn't that what, what we want? Don't you want to experience life more than anything? To experience what life is all about? That's why we're here. That's why that God put us right here in the earth. So I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 1 now. Uh, real quickly, Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to look at some things with me. Now you know we can quote this if you'd like. Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's just The word earth is the Hebrew word eoretz. Okay? And that word eretz, uh, from the Hebrew, it, uh, it's not the same as what we think of when we think about the globe or the, the, uh, the ball, the, the dirt. That's, it's not the same thing. Now, I want you to go with me to Genesis 4, 11. Genesis 4 and 11. Everybody found that? It says, And now art thou cursed from the earth. That word is not erets. But why did they call it earth? In Genesis 1, 1, they called erets earth. What is that word right there? It's the Hebrew word adamah. You remember we talked about that a few weeks ago? Well, why did they translate it earth? All right, go with me to verse 14. Or, and behold, for verse 14, watch this. It says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the Adamah, Translated earth. And from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the Eretz. Now that one, that one verse has got one English word, and that one English word is earth. But in Hebrew, it has two completely different Hebrew words. It has the Hebrew word Eretz, and it has the Hebrew word Adama. Now, last week or week before, whenever, I talked a little bit about the Adama. Mm -hmm. And the Adama, I, I used it, 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 the first part of that word is Adam. That's where we get the idea of Adam and Eve. And that's not the word, that's not what the word means, Adam. Adam is, is the first building block of a sail. It's where light, it's where, it's where the electron, the neutron, and the proton have come together to create a sail. That's the first building block. But we gave it the name Adam like it was a male species. But it wasn't. It was a cell, a building block to build the I, the self, the ego, the physical body. And that's called Adama. It comes from the word Adam, Adam. So that's the cell. Now, I, and you know when you see that you see things like this in verse 14 where you have the use of one English word earth and yet two different Hebrew words Adama and Eretz and, and you have to realize these these two Hebrew words are compilation of glyphs don't mean the same thing even though we translate it like it is the same thing and, and I, that's what I see is that brings so much confusion Whereas if we can realize that my soul, which is myself, is the gift God gave me to, to grow, to cultivate. Have you ever read in the scripture the salvation of your soul? Y'all remember that? 
Well, why in the world, if you're if you you think that your soul is already mature, immortal, timeless, you think all those things because usually people think the soul and the spirit synonymously synonyms. They're not. The soul is eternal, but its design is for tempora temporality. That's what it's designed. It's designed for the temporal experience it, that it gets here. That's how God gets to experience it. God don't change. Y'all know that. Mm -hmm. God is changes. Well, what is God? God is spirit. Spirit don't change. Spirit change, changes. Spirit is all-powerful. Well, you have the all-powerful one as a deposit within you. That all-powerful one, we call it creator, it creates. So you are the creator of your own world, whether that world be bliss or chaos. You can blame that on somebody else. And that was, that's the greatest thing that Christianity has had, blame it on somebody else. It was that woman in the garden, bless God. <laughs> she brought it on all of us. Or it's the devil. It's the devil. It's Satan. He snuck in there like a snake and he and he, he crooked up everybody. <laughs> he tripped everybody up. Now look, we're all in a mess. It's the devil's fault, bless God. No, it's not the woman's fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's our own creation. And if we could ever see that, then we could begin to own that. Then guess what? We could begin to change that. You can't change it if you don't own it. You can't see it. You can... You know, we have these little pet things like back in back in our hyper Christian, my my hyper Christian days in charismania, faith, calling things that be not as though they were. In other words, writing checks on a checking account that don't have any money in it because bless God, I'm using faith to get God to move mountains for me and it's going to be there. I'm calling myself well when I'm sick. I mean, yeah, I was in, I, we were all in that, I was in that hyper Faith, charismania stuff. And it's not, it's a lie. It's not the truth. Many times the truth is I'm sick. <laughs> That's the truth. I am sick. Well, what do I need? I need a healing. I need to face my reality. You can't get to where you want to go until you face the reality of where you are. If you think that where you are is that you're whole and complete, and you're not, you can't get to hold and complete because you won't face the reality where you are. We have to face that reality. And the reality of the fact that my self, my soul, my ego is still a little child or is still not matured or still hasn't learned the disciplines that it needs for it to move on in life. If I haven't faced that, I can, I can deceive myself and act like I'm, I'm something I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I guess we all get kind of trapped or tricked in that. I know I do. I, I know that I do. So when I read verses like this, and I can just go on and on and on, especially when you get into the word ani, the I, that God constantly calls himself, I, myself, I will. That's the ego. That's the ego. That's what that word means, and that's what that word is all about. So, Genesis, go with me to Genesis chapter 1 again. Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse 3. Verse 3 it says, And God said, Let there be light. Everybody say light. 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 That's the Hebrew word or. Or or. You can say it either way. Or or or. Okay? And I want to, uh, let me read you some, some notes of some stuff that... Uh, couple of different guys talks about. Now, we can say light, we can use a phrase, God, creator, that's the same thing, right? Right? God, yep. creator, is light. Right? Yep. God is light. 
Now, am I light? Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> you might not know you are, but you are light. Mm -hmm. So is your soul, your ego, yourself light? Yeah. yeah, it's the product and the results of light. Yeah, can that light be dark? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Now I want to quote some, I want to quote a couple of people like uh, Jacob Bowman. He was a mystic in the 16th century. And you can read a lot of different books by Jacob Bowen. And here's what Jacob Bowen says. He said, The holy and the heavenly man hid in the monstrous external man is as much in heaven as God, and heaven is in him. And the heart or light of God is begotten and born in him. Thus is God in him and he in God. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. He wrote that in the 16th century. Oh, oh, Jacob did that. Now, coming on down to around the 1820s and 30s, this little group of people up in, up in around Massachusetts, up in that area around there, Walt Whitman, Emerson, and quite a number that literally shook the whole world and changed a lot of the ideologies and actually the, what they call the New Thought Movement was born out of that group of people. And here, here's something that Emerson wrote. Meantime, within man is the soul, the soul of the whole, W-H-O-L-E, the wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and per, per, particle is equally related, the eternal one. From within and from behind, a light shines through upon things. When it breathes through his intellect, it is a genius. When it breathes through his will, it is virtue. When it flows through his reflection, it is love. On this pure nature, every man is at some time sensible. It is indefinable, immeasurable, but... We know that it pervades and contains us. We know that all spiritual being is in man. Let man then learn that the sources of nature are in his own soul. Did you hear that? The sources of nature. In other words, in the deposit of your soul, yourself, your ego, is the power and the will to create your world. And it does. And we do. And I guess the first step that we would have to get to would be to be responsible or take responsibility for that. And not to try to blame everybody for whatever is happening in my world. It, and that's, that's not easy or simple. You know what I'm saying? Because it's always easier to blame something than somebody. And, and, and it's, that, right? It is for me. I'll put it that way. It is for me. Now, I just quoted from Emerson. I want to quote something to you from Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman said this, and these two guys, Whitman and Emerson, were really, really close, and I use this analogy about them, and I can't remember if it was Whitman or Emerson. One of the, one of the two of them got put in jail because he didn't pay taxes. Now, he's, here's an earth shaker. What do you mean he didn't pay taxes? He would not agree to a government that was doing what they were doing to the American Indians, which they were putting the American Indians in camps and places in Oklahoma, different places they were designated. And what started right here in North Georgia, right up there in the little town of Cahutta, called the Trail of Tears, that probably y'all are familiar with, if not should be familiar with it. It's where they begin to get all of the Indians from the whole southeastern region and march those Indians from North Georgia to Oklahoma in the dead of winter. Mm -hmm. Killed literally hundreds of thousands of women, old women, children. Killed them. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus. Heathens, getting them out. Put them in a place. Corral them. Take them out of their home, their surroundings. And Whitman would not pay taxes to a government that would do that. He protested against it. He would, be a, he would probably be a rebel 
in today's society, and I guarantee you he wouldn't pay an income tax. Guarantee he wouldn't. Because he knows it's robbery. He knows that they're stealing your money. And what's going on right now in our whole governmental system, he would not participate in it. Because it, it's, it's thievery. It's taking away your freedoms, your liberties, and all other things. So this is what this is Walt Whitman who I'm talking about. You can get a lot of books. We have statements. Used to we had them all over the doors, especially coming back here into the daycare about children, things that they said about children. We had them all over the place. Whitman said, he has begun to think how divine he himself is. Divine I am inside and out. I make holy whatever I touch. And that there is no God any more divine than yourself, your soul, your ego. No more God any more divine than that. Why? Because it's a creator. It creates. And if we start to own that, we will start to be more attentive to what we do, to what we say, because we begin to realize, wait a minute, I'm creating something here. I am creating my world. This indeed strikes a common chord with the statements of the ancient sages that man blasphemes both God and himself when he worships any power outside himself. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Truth is, <clears throat> this is notes that I wrote, truth is both in us and outside us as, as one dynamic whole. I mean, to, to say and to worship a God that's out there and not to say and worship that same God in here, in myself, is a blasphemy. It's not a truth. You have to come to realize that the God that I worship that's out there is the identical God that I should worship that's in here. That God is closer in here to me than it is out there somewhere in eternity. And if I could own that, I can come to realize. And then I fellowship with that. What does that mean? I commune with the one inside. How do I do that? Generally through silence is one of the better ways to do it. It's through silence you can, you can go in and, uh, and commune with that one. <clears throat> so the God outside me and the God inside me as one dynamic whole. The same as push and pull. The same as sunrise and sunset. Everything within us and everything outside us tells the same story when I synchronize them together. When I begin to put them together in, as, as my truth. Let's see, this is something that I wrote. The inner light, the inner light, I'm talking about right here in Genesis, God is light. God is light. The inner light is a light that first comes from an outer source. I'll say that again, the inner light. You see, this word I used a minute ago when we were talking about Adama, it's translated for earth, it's, it's a miracle substance. What is the miracle substance? It comes from the word dust. Afar. Afar in Hebrew means particles of light. Or you can say powdered light. Why? Because it's so minute. It's like a cell. It's just you can't see it unless you look at through some kind of a high-powered microscope. You can't see it. But yet, it is the very thing that makes up you and me. The very thing that makes you is God. God itself, itself, its ego, its soul, is that which makes up you. And if I'm working to try to get rid of that, I'm working to try to get rid of the very thing that I am. The inner light, <clears throat> the the inner light is the light that first comes from an outer source. How does it come? It comes through the seed of my father, 
your father, the seed of your father, the semen, because that semen is made up of light, L-I-G-H-T, which is an electron, which is part of what a cell is, penetrates that egg, and boom, then you become the miracle result of that. That's why, I, that's why I say the miracle of you, the miracle of your human body. It, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. You know, we have, every one of us, we have within us things that we have cultivated, things that we have, we have grown over the years that don't serve us and some that do serve us. We have done that. And we're not right or wrong by doing it. We've done it in ignorance. I don't think there's anybody that would really do some of the things that we really do if you had in your, if you had in your uh, knowledge all of the things that would come as a result of what you're doing. Does that make sense? I, I know there's a lot of things I wouldn't have done or I wouldn't do if I had all of the information that I needed to make a quality decision. Most of the time, we don't make quality decisions. We make off the cuff. I, I'm talking about me. I just make a decision off the cuff. I just, I just do it off of a feeling or a whim or a whim. And dear God, later, I'm, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I know why I did. I didn't have all the information I needed. If I'd had all the information I needed, I wouldn't have done it. So it comes from an outer source. In other words, light that God source energy creator uh, the field all of these different things is comes first through the seed or the sperm of my father comes through the vehicle of the spirit and the soul and the spirit is a spark off the great light and the soul is designed to carry that light and the knowledge and information of that light <clears throat> that's what your soul is designed for your soul is designed to carry information and your soul is designed to receive information. So therefore, your soul comes as inside you, not mature. It doesn't come. And your soul's already... You, you, know, you remember we, we make this... Well, that's an old soul. Y'all ever seen, seen some person, young person or older person? Oh, they are an old soul. Uh, we created that. <laughs> We created that whole ideology. No, they're a soul. And if it's in a child, it's a young soul. <laughs> so it's a young soul. It's an immature soul. It's a soul that needs training. It's a soul that longs for education. It's a soul that longs to be disciplined. And it will, it will push all of the boundaries to get it. It will. They, they do that. They, they, they do it instinctively. The problem is many times they don't learn the boundaries and so they don't, they don't get the training and then they grow older and still have that childish soul, lack of discipline, lack of information, still have it. I, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I'm, talking, yeah, I'm talking about me. So the soul comes to retain knowledge and to gain knowledge. That's why the scripture talks about the salvation of the soul. The word salvation means to make it whole, to grow it, to mature it, to, to make it one. That's, that's my work. You see, every one of us have a path, a work in life, and the work in life that you have is you. It's yourself, it's your ego, it's your soul. That's your work. And if we don't do that work, if I don't cultivate that, if I do not discipline that, if I don't train that, it don't happen. And I'm not saying that you can't enjoy then wherever you are. You can. You can enjoy yourself in your misery. <laughs> I mean, can't you? I mean, hey, yeah. You, I mean, can't you stupefy everything? Can, can we not... Uh, sear over our sensuality. We can drink it to death, smoke it to death, uh, pop a pill to death. I mean, can't we do all that and sensitize it? No, it feels good now. Oh, yeah. yeah, we do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. It's, it's not necessary, but we do it. I do it. You know, uh, like I said, I would, I would love to rewrite these first 
five to ten, twelve chapters of Genesis. I'd love to rewrite it Do I? in what I see as the original code from this Hebrew. Because when I when I begin to see this from the original code of the Hebrew, I tell you, it begins to realize, it makes me realize how marvelous my body is. How marvelous my mind is. How marvelous my ego is. How marvelous my sensual apparatus is. And the more I can begin to see the marvel in them and appreciate them, the more I can begin to love them and embrace them. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, guess what I'm learning to do? I'm going to fall in love with myself. Mm -hmm. We always want to fall in love with somebody out there. And then what do they do? They let you down. <laughs> they disappoint you. But y'all, you love with them out there. But what about yourself? Well, hell, I'm a miserable mess. I know it. Isn't that the one that you need to take care of? You see, you can't take care of none of that out there until you take care of this in here. We have to learn to do that. We have to look in the mirror and see myself and love myself and nurture myself and train myself and nourish myself and grow myself up. And then I can be what God has built and designed me to be. And that is a marvelous expression of itself, Him. So I can be the manifestation of God so that people can read my book. <laughs> not, not just the one I'm going to write about these first 10 or 12 chapters, but the, my book of my life. Not that they can do it or duplicate it. It ain't got nothing to do with that. It, you know, it, Paul said, follow me only as I follow the Christ. And that wasn't follow me as I'm following Jesus. The Christ was the principle of God within the being. It's a Greek, it's the Greek word means the unction, the inspiration. It's the God within. That's what the Christ is. The Christ is not somebody that hung on a tree 2,000 years ago for my sins. The woe is me. <laughs> there ain't nobody that ain't got the Christ in them. There ain't nobody that don't have the unction, the anointing, the, the, the Holy One. Everybody has it. You didn't invite it there. You born with it there. Right. We need to nourish it and we need to cultivate it. So, uh, comes through the seat of my Father. Mm -hmm. The Spirit is the spark off the great light. The Spirit is the spark off the great light. Can you, can you get the, the Spirit is the spark. Do I have the Spirit? Yes, I have the spark of God. Does the spark equal the whole? Absolutely. It comes from it. It is it. It's inside me. It's the spark is the light in my soul. And it is designed to carry that light and the knowledge and the information of that light. This inner light that seeks outer expression and the outer light that seeks deposit inwardly may seem to be a contradiction, but it, it, is, a, it is summed up in two, two words used in the book of Genesis in the third chapter and the 14th verse. Look at it with me. Genesis, the third chapter and the 14th verse. And because of all this false teaching and the lies that we have so embraced from religion, if we go back into it, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm talking to people who sat under my teaching for years. I, I hear them and I watch them and I see them slip right back in and out of their old ideologies of, of Adam and Eve, they sinned, and so we're all sinners as a result of that. The devil and Satan and all of the demons, I'm warring against them. and I, I mean, I don't know how people can do that. I don't know how you can have your, your eyes opened up and you can see the lie that's in all of that and then go right back to that. You know, I, but people do. People do. This is like I just said with the Christ. People do. People, Even people who heard my teaching for many, many years go right back and bow down to Jesus. I don't get that. I don't get that. I'm not against that. I'm not for that. I just don't get how that people who can 
have a revelation that Jesus is a mythology. It's a fabulous story, but the fabulous story is about me. And if you want to say that I am Jesus, then I can associate with that. Fine. I am the Christ. I can associate with that. Fine. But if you're trying to say Jesus is one that took your sins, and then you're trying to load all your stuff off on him, thinking you're going to get free, you ain't going to get free. You ain't going to get free until you deal with it yourself. Oh, Brother Lee. Oh, how could that be? Because you see, the light that is God is in you as light. And it's deposited itself in you for the very purpose of you being that light. Okay, verse, did I tell you verse 14? Is that where I said to go? Yes. Uh, Verse, verse 14, And the Lord God said to the serpent, Behold, thou hast done this, and you are cursed. Say that word, cursed. That word, cursed, in Hebrew, well, let's see here. Uh, let me go. The word, light. Is, is that. I'll leave a rash, and the, and it spells. Uh, let's see here. Let me let me do this. Right. I left out one. <laughs> okay, that's the that's the word for light. L i g h t. And that's called Alif Wav Arash. Alif, this is a number one, a Wav is a number six, and Arash is 200. Alif Wav Arash. And that's the word for light, and it's pronounced Or. R R A W R. R or Or. That's the word for light. Okay? Now, you see this word curse? Right here? Y'all you'll see that when I said verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this thing, you are cursed. The serpent. That's the nachesh. Well, what is the nachesh? Alright, if this is the stick man. Okay? This is in other words, this is you. This is the happy you. Okay? The serpent. What is the serpent? Well, here's what the serpent is. Have you ever heard of the Kundalini? Hmm? Yes. What is the Kundalini? Kundalini is the serpent on the pole. The same as the Caduceus. It's the same thing. Well, the Nachesh that's, lit, that's mentioned here, what is it? It's the energy that runs up and down the spinal column in your back. That, that, that's the core of your being. The spinal column and the brain is one unit. They're not separate. If you were to take hold of your brain and pull your brain out, your brain would consist of your entire spinal column that runs right down through the core of your back and the nerves that goes off the whole electrical system. That's your brain. That's the Kondalini. That's the serpent. That's the Nachesh. See, this, this word Nachesh doesn't mean snake. That's what they told you and me in Genesis 3.1. The snake went in there. The devil. Mm -hmm. Satan. No, it doesn't say that. It says the Nachesh. The word Nachesh means that that you learn by experience. That's what the word means. So how do you learn something by experience? You learn it through yourself, your ego, your sensual apparatus that you see, smell, taste, touch, hear, and feel. That's how you learn, right? I mean, if it feels bad enough, bless God, you'll stay away from it. If it just keeps on hurting you and beating you up, you'll finally wake up. Why? Because of your experience. That's your not cash. That's certain. That's what you call the devil. Satan. Best friend you ever had? 
<laughs> How do you mean the devil, the booger, the booger man? Look at what it says now. The Lord, verse 14 said unto the serpent, Because you have done this thing, thou art cursed. Cursed. What is the word? The word cursed is our or. In other words, it's the word light from within with the light from without. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, isn't God the light from without that He deposited itself within? That's exactly right. Now, you see, why in the world would a creator create its creation and then curse it like you and me think curse means? In other words, now then, the rose bushes have got briars on them. <laughs> oh, before they didn't have briars on them? <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. That's religion that told us all of this crap, this garbage. You see, the light, that's the word curse. Or, or. It's the same word right here, is light. Spelled twice. Referring to the light. And so how do you learn by experience? The light from without is pulling against the light from within. The light from within is pushing with the light from the out. And it's to synchronize the two lights that you begin to harmonize your life and you begin to grow and you begin to find the very thing that we all seek. We all seek freedom. We all seek peace. And we all seek health. And that's the miracle of you. And every bit of that's within us. It's within our own ability. And it's that that we should all press toward, grow toward, develop toward, so that I'm developing myself to become and to be all that God, the Father, has designed me to be. So that now that I love the creation of the Creator. It's foolish for me to say I love the Creator and hate His creation. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, what do you mean the creation? I mean everything here, good, bad, right, wrong. That's all God's creation. God created the, the good and God created the evil. Mm -hmm. And guess what? God appointed you and me to be in charge of every bit of it so that now then, if we want to blame it on anybody, blame it on the self. Look in the mirror. And see. And when I'm talking about blaming it on yourself, I'm not talking about blaming it on your ego because you're going to blame it on your ego. Now you have all the other justifiable reasons to kill the ego and get rid of that rascal. <laughs> Rather than to treat the ego just exactly like it should be treated, like a little child. Beating a child does not train and discipline that child. I, I, I was raised that way. And that's how my parents thought that's how you train a child. But you train a child through love and instructions. That's how you really train a child. And if your ego is your little child, you will, if you will love that and nurture that, then you can train it. And then it will serve you like it's designed to do. Serve you for your greater good. Amen? Amen. All right, then. We'll any questions? Everybody, we just quit right here. I thought about what you said about the knowledge. People don't want knowledge. Mm -hmm. They read that scripture where it says knowledge puffs up. So okay, the word that uh, that's in Second Corinthians. Paul said knowledge. That's the only place it said the word puffs up. Mm -hmm. Actually, the word puff up means to swell like a seed that's put in its place of growth. And what does the seed do? It swells up and breaks the skin so the new growth can come forth. Mm -hmm. So when you understand that and you realize knowledge is that which swells the seed mm -hmm. of the Word of God inside you and breaks the outer shell that's, that's tough and hard mm -hmm. so that that new life can come forth. Yeah. So people who... Have, we have all been taught knowledge puffs up. We would take the word puff up to say it makes you haughty and yeah. arrogant mm -hmm. and intellectual. Yeah. That's a lie. That's why they take it. Yeah. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. Right. Knowledge 
puffs, it swells up the hard outer mm -hmm. shell so that the life of God can come forth and come through you. Yes. Completely a different take when you really see the truth of the words. Yeah. But there again, we get tricked uh -huh. by deception. Yeah. That's where they try to sell us these lies and call them the truth so that they can get us to drink their Kool-Aid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all did. Okay. We all do. 